Hi, I'm Maggie Greenfield, Executive Director of the Bronx River Alliance. Welcome back to the amazing Bronx River Flotilla. This is our second segment in our virtual uh, flotilla this year. Today, our river guides are our recreation coordinator, Roderick Bell, and local Bronx historian, Stephen DeVillo. Together with them, you're going to be paddling the same waters that people have been paddling for millennia. I hope you, you can support our work to keep the river clean and green for paddling adventures so we can all learn from this rich history of the Bronx River. Just click on the link in the description in the chat to show your support. Thank you so much. And now let's turn it over to Stephen and Roderick. Hi, I'm Stephen Paul DeVillo. I'm a lifelong Bronxite and a local historian, as well as an alumnus of the Bronx River Alliance. And I'm going to take you through some of the history and the Native American lore of the Bronx River. Hi, my name is Roderick Bell. Uh, I'm with the Bronx River Alliance. I am the recreational coordinator. And I'll be your tour um, to talk about the history of the Bronx River, pre-contact and after contact. Ready? One, two, three. Well, welcome to the Bronx River. We're approaching a spot that the uh, Native Americans knew as Aquajanam, which meant something like roughly where the path crosses over. Uh, today we know it as Fordham Road, but it's uh, still a crossing point even after all these years. Now the Bronx River was known to the Native Americans, the Lenape Lenape people, as uh, Aquahung. And there's different interpretations of what exactly that means. It uh, could be something like the River of High Bluffs, or it could mean uh, possibly a place sheltered from the wind, which is a very apt description of where we are today in the uh, New York Botanical Garden. This is the Bronx River Gorge, which was carved out by glaciers, glacial meltwater 10,000 years ago. So either interpretation may be correct. Uh, the Europeans, of course, they named it after first uh, European settler, Jonas Brock, and became known as Bronx's River. And from once we get the county and the borough and everything else. The three main things that attracted them to this area were the fur, the forest, and the fish. Yeah. And of course, you had the beavers, you had otters, you had all types of different uh, wildlife. Uh, the Bear Swamp, for example, which we, we just passed about a mile upstream from where we are today, was a, a very important uh, hunting ground for the Native Americans in the area. And uh, there literally were bears in there at one time, and uh, bears are very important to the uh, Lenape people. You can do a lot of things with uh, bear products. Bears definitely had um, something called uh, bear, bear fat or the indigenous people would use it as a bear grease. Um, bear grease was so powerful that um, there are traditions and stories of men be being able to uh, go ice fishing. And how you do that is you just uh, cover yourself with this bear grease that you harvested and uh, during these ice cold uh, weathers and seasons the men could jump in and catch any type of fish that they wanted in the ice cold, so thanks to the bear grease. So bears definitely were very important. Um, and in, in uh, different dialects, especially the Algonquin dialects, uh, the bear is called the mosque. And the, uh, the Lenape are still with us today. The two main groupings are in Oklahoma and Wisconsin. But uh, there is still a band uh, living in this area, the, uh, the Ramapo Nation, mm -hmm. up in Orange and Rockland County. That's right. Which uh, still is preserving, very actively working to preserve and protect their Native American heritage. Yeah, we're going to make a left up here. Yeah, so where we are now is actually was the worst pollution of the Bronx River. Uh, early 1800s, they're sometimes called the Twin Dams, sometimes the Bolton Dams. And one of the very first uh, factories to use chlorine bleach was set up here on the banks of the Bronx River. So they, basically they finished cloth coming out of the mill. So they used chlorine bleach, you know where that went. The dyed cloth, you know where the dye went. And, it was said at one time he could tell the day of the week by what color the river was. Ooh. I mean, they're, they're long gone now, but they're just a memory. Can we bring this down to you? Yeah. 
and we just made it over the twin dams, famous twin dams. Again, we're, we're paddling through the uh, the southern extremity of the Bronx River Gorge. This is one of the few places on the river where, you know, going through a deep rocky gorge, uh, the river doesn't change its course over the centuries. So the river is pretty much where the Native Americans found it and where we find it. And we're approaching uh, uh, the village of West Farms, which is uh, probably the oldest European settlement on the Bronx River. And it was not founded by the Dutch, it was founded by Connecticut Yankees. And they did a deal with uh, seven Wekoskic uh, sachems. And they set up a series of farms and they wondered what to call it. We've got East Chester, we've got West Chester, we're running out of Chesters here. So they just called it the West Farms. And it's known as such to this day, even though it's perhaps the most intensely urbanized area of New York City. I think it's also really fascinating to know that a lot of the indigenous communities that lived here, a lot of the uh, Algonquin and Wapinger and Lenape communities, they never put borders in between any of this land. Yeah. You know, they moved around so much, there was no need to put, even put borders, you know. Everyone considered themselves a family. Everyone had their own section of territory that they primarily used. But there was really no, no divides at all between the land. Everybody, all the land was shared. And these waters are pretty much a, a, a highway, an ancestral highway. The primary form of travel was through a canoe or a machine. Mm. A machine meaning a dugout was highly used and it was essentially a family member to the tribe or to that village. Um, it was a living vessel. These machines were, you know, big, big enough to fit 40, 30 to 40 men and women side by side, you know. Sometimes they would call them war canoes. But sometimes those are canoes that uh, communities used to go out whaling. Whaling was a big, mm. big thing out here especially out in Long Island and uh, Massachusetts. But where we are now, now this looks like a beautiful broad uh, lake. It's called the uh, Bronx Lake, in fact. And this, this did not exist in Native American times. When the, uh, the European peoples moved in, among other things, they, they looked upon rivers as economic resources, something you could make money out of or, you know, make, uh, make goods out of. So first thing in their mind, it's a great place to build a mill dam. And so of course this, this lake is the backup of the, the dams that were first built as best I can make out 1674. But there's a dam there to this day. It's been a succession of dams that have occupied the site for over 300, 300 years now. But uh, the impact of the European dam building had a direct impact on the, the Native American economy. But I think people don't really realize that there was actually a symbiotic relationship going on. Mm. There was a lot of symbiosis occurring here. You know, we depended on a lot of the uh, natural resources here, the fish, the fur, the forest, as well as they depended on us, you know. And once that relationship was cut, once that connection was cut, you know, a lot of things went haywire from there. One of the very important uh you know, fish uh, food stocks of the Native American was the uh, the river herring, uh, sometimes known as the alewife herring, which is a it's a creature that uh, has to migrate between fresh and salt water. In order to spawn, it has to return to the very fresh water that itself was spawned in. So they used to say that the river ran silver because there were so many alewife in it. Um, but because of the dams uh, and the habitat destruction, the population decreased drastically. So something that the Bronx River Alliance has been doing is for the last three years, we've been stocking 400 adult alewife into the river here at this point in time, upstream of the dam that we're about to go over, which is the most downstream dam of the Bronx River. The stocked ones have their babies here, um, and those juveniles imprint on the river, and then they'll come back. And so hopefully we will start seeing um, a sustainable population that can spawn uh, over and over and over again. Rapids coming up? 
Rapids? Yeah, you got the West Farms Rapids. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, this is really one of the nicest stretches of the river, too, to paddle down. And this was the beginning of the, uh, the, the truly citizen-led restoration efforts on the river in 1974. It's a woman by the name of Ruth Anderberg formed the, the Bronx River Restoration. She drove a truck in the Army in World War II, so you, you didn't mess with Ruth Anderberg. So one thing she knew, she knew this neighborhood, they're like zillions of old tires. So she got the kids, she got a whole band of kids together, and they gathered up the tires, and they stacked them up on the riverbank. And they filled them in with rubble from demolished uh, buildings. And then to make sure they stayed in place, they scavenged the boiler tubes from an abandoned factory and used them to hammer them into place. So you're looking at something that's been there for what, 45 years now? Uh, 45 years worth of Bronx River spring floods. As you pass by on your right hand side, was the very first uh, citizen created park along the river too. And they named it uh, Restoration Park in 1980. Now that stretch of river back in say 1974, if you look down from the train going ahead, overhead, you wouldn't have seen the river at all. That whole stretch was just literally covered chock-a-block with discarded appliances, refrigerators, washing machines, uh, God knows what, they even found an old wine press in there. And it's only because you read the map that you knew there was a river flowing <laughs> underneath there. So that, that gives you an idea of the scale of work that the, the citizen volunteers carried out between 74 and 1980. But you're entering now, this is the Bronx River uh, estuary, and this is all tidal, uh, the you know, salt water it gets increasingly salty as you go down. Now the second bridge there, that's the Cross Bronx Expressway. But yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with the Cross Bronx Expressway and the damage it did. Well, I got a little surprise to you. Once we go underneath the uh, the Bronx River Expressway, I'll show you the mysterious Pillar of Moses. Robert Moses could be stopped. He wasn't a uh, irresistible force by any means. I'll show you evidence of that. And there it is, looming up in the distance, like something out of Ozymandias. Is the mysterious Pillar of Moses. Moses' idea is that the Sheridan Expressway was going to go all the way up and it was going to connect with I-95, about where Co-op City is today. And it was community opposition stopped it. Now this was in the 1950s, you know, things like that weren't supposed to happen, but nevertheless it did. Now he'd already gone ahead and started to build an off-ramp that would connect the Sheridan with the Cross Bronx Expressway. And when the community opposition stopped, he stopped and he walked away from the project. And these, these are the remains of the, I sometimes call it the vexation of Moses. Back in the, uh, the 1920s, there was a very famous amusement park there known as Starlight Park. That's given its name to the uh, you know, successor parks that occupy the site today. What my grandparents used to talk about, a lot of people were very nostalgic about uh, Starlight Park and all the, they had all kinds of things. They had a saltwater swimming pool. They had uh, live opera on summer evenings. It was quite the place to be at one time. Now these parklands on the left were uh, totally abandoned for over 70 years. They're inaccessible, you know, not, not safely accessible anyway. Uh, when the amusement park went bust at the end of the 1930s. And then when Moses came through with the Cross Box Expressway, that demolished whatever remnants there were. And there, there's no trace of the amusement park anymore. But all the river that we're going through right now has been rechanneled. Moses wanted to make sure that the footings of his expressways stayed where they were put. So just to make sure the river didn't have any other ideas, he rechanneled it into a, a straight course as we see now. And you notice both the banks are armored with stone. So uh, the river's uh, propensity to rechannel itself won't take place.
Hey! Hello there. Again, I'm Maggie Greenfield. I hope you guys enjoyed that historical tour of the river. Your support can help us keep Bronx River history alive and surface the traditions of the indigenous cultures who once lived along the Bronx River. Be sure to tune in on Saturday, August 1st. We're gonna be giving you a tour of the Lower River and showing you how we're transforming polluted lots into beautiful waterfront parks.